Great stuff. Thank you very much. I see that we have a crowd to get in here. <laughs> um, my name is Luther Becker. Um, I'm an artist and uh, an instigator. And um, I would like to welcome everybody here today for the Law Symposium here at TUT, especially the guests that are going to us about certain aspects of this. So I think I've learned something. I'm sure we've learned something from today. Thank you for taking the time to come share it with us. Um, glass all around us, it's only present. It's part of our society. Just think about the glass that you touch just before you came in. Screen that you have in your pocket. Um, it affects everybody's daily lives. We interact with it. It's material. It's as material. It's infinitely recyclable. So, Chaz will know more about that than the sure we're going to learn about that. It's precious yet disposable. Think of the COVID, the vaccine of COVID, for COVID being transported in glass vials, high glass, high rise buildings. Lighting bottles of heat and more. What is beautiful, it's dangerous and protects. The United Nations proclaimed 2022 the International Year of the Glass. In all its, its various iterations, the dreadful material could also be found in art. Ai Weiwei just recently unveiled this enormous song here in Venice, titled um, Moving from Memory to Mori, that's all made in glass. Today we gained some insights from several, several speakers. I've mentioned that already. We're going to be touching some history on trade goods involving glass, mass production of containers, such as bottles, um, architecture, and then sustainability of glass. I also encourage everybody here, which you've already done, in the UT glass unit to have a look at the students are doing here in this facility. TUT Glass Studio is the only tertiary institution that offers glass as a great medium on the South South African continent. So it's, 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 a, it's a magical node for great glass. Thank you. There's also a show, the Next, next Generation exhibition, which um, is curated by Mark Lee uh, and Taylor at St. Lorraine, so the Julian Group Gallery, which works from and uh, current students. It's highly affordable works, some really amazing cookie little things there. It's, um, I would say, collectible. Also, just incidentally, the UNESCO has proclaimed several years ago already that mouth blown glass and related crafts um, as an immaterial cultural heritage. And it's through institutions like TUT as well as studios over the country and like when you have said, keep this tradition, this 2,000 year old heritage alive still. Also, I need to mention the Fire Art Exhibition at the Victoria Art Museum that's <coughs> on the 30th of October um, with 16 artists that are torch bearers within in the field that have um, a lot of work to keep glass in the public eye as a creative medium. Definitely worth of an exhibition to see. We will be publishing a catalog soon because we just went through all the events and we'd like to add a little bit of each to the comprehensive catalog. This catalog will then also be presented um, in December at the closing ceremony for the International Year of Glass uh, in New York and in Japan, at the UN in New York. Um, then also, what needs to mention is that this year's win winner of the Upside Down of the Year, Gerard Sapoto Well done, my Gopo. I think you bringing glass, especially African glass, into the spotlights. It's, it's well deserved. So. Thank you. So, she will be spending three months in Paris. Residency, and as I understand, there's already motion going on trying to find glass studios and, and, and related things. So that's not well, that's excellent. Now. Also, this past week, uh, the TUT, Tony University of Technology Arts Festival took place here um, 
on the Arts Campus. It must have been an exciting event and firing, as you can see that it's <laughs> um, And for that, the TUT Glass Studio collaborated with the Winger Glass, bringing master blowers, CBC, Sylvan Kleinger, and James Ogoule here to work with students and inspiring students. And um, I think that's a, that's a very important connection that we should go through. James also currently has a work, incidentally, in, at the Toyama Glass Museum in Japan, the new glass now exhibition. So it's another representation of African glass within the <coughs> So with that, I'd like to thank the Tsuana University of Technology for offering the venue and also assisting the students working hard putting everything together. Thank you so much. And when you're class, for all your effort and, and taking the time to share your knowledge. Also to the Fire Club Steering Committee, Chairs, Michael Caitlin. Yeah, without you, this, this hill would have been a mountain. Thank you very much. So, with that, I open up the floor to Changing techniques occurred over time. So the glass 
provides tangible evidence of his trade engagements, the glass beads, that is. And so, for example, we can see the shift in the centers in which the glass was made moving over time. And we can see who's actually controlling these trade markets over time. So, for example, our earlier speeds that we discover all the way down here on the Limpopo River, that confluence of the Shashi and Limpopo, is where we find our earlier speeds at a site which has just goes by the name of Schroeder. And these are cobalt blue, they blue green beads, um, tiny little beads, and we find them. Uh, the analysis of the glass shows us that they come from the Middle East. And of course, it seems that the concentration there and the trade markets are around that Persian Gulf. At the time, we know that the trade is coming in and out of Safari. We can see there, based on what we find in the coastal areas, who's active and who isn't. And we've got some early records indicating that that is the case. Now, over time, by about AD 909, the Fatimid dynasty takes over power. And of course, they then conquer Fusta, which is there, it's, it's now one day Cairo. And they then take over the market. And we see that then the market shifts to this Red Sea Mediterranean area. And the beads uh, that are coming in, of course, then change. And I'll show you a little bit how they do change. By the 10th century, it's moved back across to India. But at this particular point, the beads are in currency. And so they're actually been traded out of many different points. By the 11th to the 15th century, we start seeing that the Islamic mercantile population are starting to occupy that African uh, east coast. And they set them along the deltas, the river mouths, and they're setting up these stations for trade. And these are, are really important because these early other traders and geographers give descriptions of the coastline, they give descriptions of people, and they also tell us what they're taking out of Africa and also where it's going. So, for example, we do know that all the ivory, of course, that's leaving from our area down here at this particular point in time is going up both to India for cones <laughs> and chess pieces, interestingly enough. Um, but also across all the way to China because they wanted those long tusks to be able to have the pallets in which to carry people. So we can trace then where our ivory and what our connections are at that particular point in time. We also know, of course, what's coming in. So we can track the ideas that are coming in. And we see within our area here that spindle wheels are coming in, so the idea of spinning fabric, <coughs> cotton comes in at that particular time. <coughs> And of course, a whole range of different food, because people tend to want food that they're familiar with. So rice obviously gets introduced into your Madagascar area, as do bananas, which come back, sorry, Madagascar and Mozambique. Bananas come from Madagascar and they're traded across. And an array of other things that of course we don't really want, like the black rat also comes down, uh, carrying its disease as it did from Asia, and so we get bubonic plague coming into Africa. But along with that, we also get the domestic chicken. So we see the arrival of chickens also coming along these different trade routes. Now, these trade routes have occurred and happened for a very, very long period of time. We know, of course, that glass, we've already heard, glass blowing starts 2,000 years ago, but actually working with glass dates back to about 5,000 years ago. So it's got a much longer tradition in time. And of course, it goes along with these trade networks as well. And the Pacific trade networks, which of course are here, along with China, were well established. These then developed a little bit later. And you can see how these early um, movements were initially along the coast, because that was kind of the safest way of doing it. But essentially, the seas weren't a barrier. They, in fact, were ways in which you could get materials across. And so we see them starting to use these uh, oceans and seas quite, quite useful, quite effectively. And one of the ways in which they were doing that, of course, is with the dial. Uh, now, what we do find is that the dial made maritime trade uh, possible. But also, 
It was quite a small boat, as you can see, so it wasn't without its peril. Sometimes they would lose uh, food and water, other times a storm would come up, and of course they would then land up on the first line. So it wasn't always great, but what they were finding is that in fact they could carry more on these boats than often they could carry over land. Now this is kind of an important thing. Sorry, I'm pointing and I don't realize that there's one there. Um, up until now, of course, remember that there is a huge trade going along the Silk Route all the way to Europe. But those camels and those trade routes could be captured and they could be hijacked. And of course, we find that that happens in the late 1400s, which of course then forces Europe to start sailing around. So up until now, Europe's not even thinking about coming to North Africa. It's very far, why would they? It's only once those trade routes are cut off and controlled by the Islamic traders that they are then forced to say, well, you know what, if we want part of this, we're going to have to go and get it ourselves. And so then they're forced to come around to Africa. So we see that um, for hundreds of years, they affect um, the use of boats. They, of course, eventually start moving across the Indian Ocean as well. They use these monsoon winds, uh, which take them down in our summertime and back again in our winter time with the monsoon, monsoon winds change. And it's a very effective way of getting around. But of course, this is only successful if you can make uh, good relations with people at the places that you stop at. So, if people aren't going to be willing to trade with you, you've got nothing. And what we find, of course, is that these trade stations start taking on the language of trade, so new language develops, and we know Swahili develops out of this, and that's very much a language of trade. But also, you need to offer people something in order to get them to trade with you. And these are one of these items that we see regularly traded and were sought after um, in these particular areas. So if we zoom in to our particular area in that sort of Zimbabwe, Botswana, uh, South Africa nexus, we then begin to see what these sites look like. Um, this is not a great picture, but you get an idea of the landscape. I'm sure many of you have been up there. But here's Schroeder, that very early site that I talked about, the 700 ND site, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the other two sites, K2 and Bakunbu. So at Schroeder, as I said to you, we start finding these very early, small blue beads, but by the time we get to K2, we're finding tens of thousands of beads that are being traded into Africa. Some of them are blue, green, that seems to be what, what, what is being traded at that time, and they can trace them, in fact, back to the Persian Gulf. So we know it's coming from that area where the Persian Gulf was in control, and that's where the markets were at that particular time. Now, what's quite interesting about K2, and it's the only time we actually see this happening, is that there's some entrepreneur sitting there who decides that actually we can take all these blue green beads, glass beads that are brought in, and we can rework them. And so it's the only time that we actually see people melting all of these little smaller beads that they've traded in, and they're using single-use clay molds, which you can see here, we find many of them at these sites, in order to create a single bigger bead. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. We find a huge amount of mistakes. But what they then do is they take those bigger beads and they trade them off. So we find them 400 kilometers away in Botswana and all over the show. So, as I said, some kind of entrepreneur sitting there thinking, you know what, I can take these beads, turn them into a much bigger bead, and I'll probably be able to get more for them further down the line. But it's the only time in history that we find this. We don't find any other evidence of them reworking beads. And maybe it's because it floods the market and there's no need to do that afterwards. Now, as you know, then we go off to the center of, in, in, inside of South Africa, then moves to Mapungubwe. And Mapungubwe is kind of where we actually see a complete, complete change in the way in which the society is structured. And we do believe it is part of this trade. We think that the Indian Ocean trade is, of course, growing now. Um, we're seeing that this is 
this is um, developing. It's at this point where they near full start. It's the Mediterranean area, and presumably gold we know is going out of South Africa. Ivory, no doubt, is going out of South Africa at a large scale, and it's at this time that we start seeing classes forming within those African societies. So whereas before we saw people farming with cattle, etc., all of a sudden we see an elite develop. And we know they're an elite because they're moving on top of the hill. There's the hill at Mapungubwe. And of course, I'm sure you're very familiar with the history of Mapungubwe when they excavated. Of course, they found in the graves of some of these elite people the gold pieces. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit about them. But just to indicate here, you know, um, the beads, the glass beads, again, they have changed. They are now very rounded. They are called oblate beads. So there is the manufacturing change that's happened at the marketing, but also notice the change in colours. And we start getting these butterscotch and yellow beads coming through for the first time. So clearly there's more experimentation with colour, and of course the market in beads and glass beads is starting to change. Just to quickly uh, remind you, of course, of the gold that they took out of the elite burials at Barton Goodware. Um, Remembering that this is alluvial gold, it's not that they're mining gold, they panning it out of the rivers, and of course then they're taking these little bonuses of gold that they find, they're turning it into foil, and they're pinning the foil onto objects. So the golden rhino is not solid gold, it, it is effectively hollow, um, <coughs> and it can be pinned onto a wooden core. Uh, equally, you can see the little pinholes that cover the gold, and the staff, and that would have been the staff of some kind of indication of importance that the elite society granted themselves at that particular point in time. And we do believe that that strata, that change in class, if you find the commoners at the bottom and of course the elites at the top, has to do with that trade that's coming in time. Now, eventually all good things come to an end. And it seems that Mapungubwe, I mean, really is only inflorescence for about 70 years. Now, it might be that the elite leadership dies, and what happens then is that there's a split in that society and they move apart. But for whatever reason, when they move up and they move to Great Zimbabwe, that becomes the center of trade. And we see have that happening between 30 and 1450. And again, it is elaborated. Great Zimbabwe seems to have enormous control over a broad area. And we see it in the wood that they're using to build it. It's coming out of South Africa, it's being traded up. We see it in our metals being brought all the way from the Roy going all the way up through Great Zimbabwe. So whoever's in charge there now has a huge amount of power and is wielding it. And of course, we see again that Kamala and um, elite stratigraphy. Uh, that is forming in society, and it's been shown quite strongly. Now, at this particular time, uh, we can see that they're trading in Kilwa, so um, it's much further up. My map is terrible, but Kilwa is the, the, the trade center at the time, and at Great Zimbabwe, mostly gold is going on. Gold has been heavily sought. We know that there is this interaction because we've actually got coins from Kilwa, which had the Sultan of Kilwa's face on at Great Zimbabwe. So we know that the route that they're going, and of course it's at its peak at that particular point in time. And just to show some of you, I'm sure you're all very familiar with Great Zimbabwe, but here's the hill road up at the top. You can see the turrets and also the, the, um, the monoliths that guard the edge of the morning on the hill. And of course, if you're on the hill and you're looking down, you can see that massive enclosure, which is quite commonly shown as part of uh, sort of the imaging of Great Zimbabwe. And you can see the extent of that wall. It's all dry stone walling, there's no cement used, and it's enormous. And there's various interpretations of what that centre was used for. Some say it was used by a later elite king, others say that in fact it was the school of the elites. That's where the children were trained. Certainly, I think the debate will carry on for a very, very long time afterwards, uh, going in the future, but nevertheless, you can see how elaborate and big 
this particular center was at its time. Now, inevitably, as I said, towards the end of the 1400s, you get people cutting off the trade into Europe. So the Asian market going through that Arabian area decides they don't want to cut. They don't want to go into Europe anymore, they cut off the trade. And that forces the Europeans to start coming around Africa because they want to have access to all of those things that they've had access to. <coughs> the gold, the silk, the it's horses as well coming out of China, which no one can reproduce um, at, at this particular time as well. And so we see in 1497, which many of you who have been to the uh, South African history system will know, there were three boats that rounded the Cape of Good Hope, and of course they belonged to the Portuguese. And they come around to find the trade, and of course with the intent of taking over those traders. So they come into the Indian Ocean trade, and they immediately crush the uh, Islamic centers. They take them over, they attack them, and they put their own centers in place. Now, what's quite interesting from, I think, from an African perspective is that after they do this, they effectively have to kind of wait. Well, they, they left waiting. They're thinking that the gold's going to come to them. They're thinking that all of these trade goods are just naturally going to come to the center. And they don't. The Africans find different ways of trade, and they start shifting and moving around. <coughs> and so it's in the, the late sort of 1500s then, that eventually the Portuguese have to start pushing their way into the interior to develop their own trade networks. And of course it's at that time that they take their priests with them, because that's what the Portuguese did, and that's how Christianity enters Southern Africa. It's notable though that Islam does not move into Southern Africa. So for all the time that you have these Islamic centers on the coast, the religion doesn't move in. And what that probably tells us is that the Africans were controlling the trade from the interior and the trade was moving out. So they were trading, they probably had middlemen, and they moved to the centers where the trade was happening, and we know that those trade centers occurred. But it was only when the Portuguese come in that they, of course, are left on the lurch of the coast, and they have to start moving in to develop their own trade networks. And it's at that point that we get religion being transferred into the African. So that's effectively the story of the early trade. And we see the trade continuing through Venetian beads. Sorry, I should go back. There's my early, uh, these are Portuguese Venetian beads that are brought in. Again, different colors. At this point, it becomes quite difficult for us. Although, chemically, you could say they come from Europe, in terms of manufacture and very much the color and the kinds of things that they were using, sometimes it muddies the picture. So what we find is they knew what the market was, they knew what was popular within Africa, and so they made their beads to suit. And so they would imitate the Indian beads, um, and they would imitate a lot of the beads that had been created in Asia and Europe. And therefore, when we find them, it's kind of like, okay, are we looking at the original, which is early, or are we looking at an imitation that comes in through the Portuguese? So that, unfortunately, creates a little bit of a problem for us. Through time, of course, the rest of Europe gets onto this bandwagon, and of course, by the time you get your colonial starting to settle within Southern Africa, they are still using beads as a mechanism of trade. And the, the missionaries coming into Southern Africa then, of course, also do the same thing. So we see in the 1800s, the British missionaries, when they start moving into the interior, into Gauteng, uh, and then going off into the Free State, of course, bring bags and beads. What we realize then, though, is that the African counterparts who've been trading in glass beads for millennia basically are quite classy. And very often they would say, well, we don't want these beads. Well, these are cheap beads, we don't want those. And they were quite selective about what they wanted. And the mission leaves actually you can read in their diaries how they're trying to keep up with what the fad is at the time and making sure that they have glass beads that go along with it. What I've also found, and I found in the Free State, is that glass 
for some reason, doesn't seem to hold together as well as what we're finding in some of these earlier sites. So, glass is beautiful because it does preserve incredibly well, so it's there, you'll find it. But, what we were finding in the Free State, for example, at the mission sites, is that in certain soils, and I don't know whether it's just an acidic or alkaline soil that does it, it seems to destabilize the glass, and when we were picking up the beads, they were shattered. So it was like picking up candy. And I've yet to fully understand what it was in the chemistry of the soil, and possibly in the way in which the glass was made, possibly cheaply, I don't know, um, that would allow the glass not to hold together as well. It's the first time I've ever experienced that when dealing with glass, where it just shattered into a, I mean, not yet, it's just a powder, really. Um, and we had a hard time trying to make sure that we could get the beans out in the corner without them actually shattering. So that was an interesting thing. And it's, of course, at that time that we started some bottle glass coming in as well. Through the mission, we contact mostly in the interior of Southern Africa. Bottle glass has been there all along in the West Coast, and we see that cellulose and all sorts of things. Window glass starts coming in, and they start building churches and things like that as well. They start importing little small panes of flat glass. But the glass I want to talk about here is that that we actually worked with on this itself. And it was something, it was a project that I fell into just incidentally because of its West, West Campus was the site of the original Rand show. I wouldn't say actually the original. The original was over where Rodine was. I don't know if anybody went to school there. It's a little swimming park time. But because there was an Anglo Boer War, or the Second South African War, in between, and a lot of people were apparently put or held prisoner in that area, they decided not to use that space and they moved it across to this. So from about 1909, that became the site of the agricultural show. And of course, so you're coming out of that depression, you're coming out of that war period, and gold is now becoming a big thing. Uh, there's a lot of mining on the go, and it's at this time that we're starting to see these bottles appearing, which of course, once again, show us trade networks at the time. Bearing in mind that, of course, mining wasn't just about discovering gold, there's a whole lot of entrepreneurs who would then come in on the back of any new settlement. And of course, very often that's developed uh, or reflected in the commodities that we start finding at that time. So what happened was they started building on West Campus, and at the same time they started producing, or in their diggings, all of these bottles started coming up. And of course, as the archaeologist, I was able to walk in and say, sorry, we can't do this. This is historic stuff, historic ground. You've got to let us excavate. And so we started excavating these dumps. And I was quite keen to see if we could then isolate the very early shows from the much later shows. Bearing in mind, of course, that there's a long period of time that these shows occurred on campus. Now, just to show you then how glass and glass bottles can help us in that way, first of all, as you all know, I'm not going to tell you about this because this is your thing. Uh, the earliest bottles, of course, were blown, and then, of course, over time, they start using models, and then there were semi automated machines, and then the automated machines. Now, what happens is we can obviously the, see the, the blown ones and the contour at the end. So that gives us a good idea of the amount of the bottle. But what's also important is that these machines that were being developed from about the 1850s, um, of course, were being invented and reworked quite rapidly. People were developing patents for them. And as a result, they then give us an idea of climate change. Because each of these machines produced different markings. They either had a middle seam or a side seam, or they had a groove or something that would allow us then to say, okay, we know exactly which machine made this model, and therefore we can actually date it. So that gives us insight into the dates of the models. Of course, the models that you can see here also have trademarks um, and various other things associated with them. That also gives us some kind of indication of when these models were in use. This is just to give you an idea of where we are at. So this is the the side of bits. This is obviously two campuses to bits, and it was this side that was used 
as the rain showed rounds from 1909 and the entrance was at the bottom and came on up. At the top here, this is what you can see was the old show grounds that were there used to show some of the animals and also they had a, a, a track when they started bringing cars in to show off the cars. The grandstands are in there and uh, bandstands and all sorts of things that were part of the show at the time. And what they were doing was they were starting to develop this side of this. So um, if you can see, I can't really see here, but there's a there's the tower of light, uh, and also on the side they were putting in new science buildings. And that was the area that I was very really interested in, because this was part of the earliest uh, show jobs. Just to also remind you that the Empire Exhibition was also held on these same showgrounds in 1936. Uh, there's some of the early um, sort of pamphlets that were used to, to advertise it, and uh, the Tower of Light, which you see on the left of it, right of it, is of course what's left of that old Empire Exhibition. And this Empire Exhibition was seen to be the shop window of the Empire. So this was the place where people were going to bring all of their commodities to show them off to the rest of the world in 1936. Again, an opportunity to bring in materials. So we started excavating, and then you can see this was a first year project, giving them some um, idea of what it's like to work in an, an archaeological site, and slowly to show them taking out these dumps. Now, what we found was quite interesting. These wonderful torpedo bottles, um, which are some of the earliest bottles that we used to hold carbonated beverages. So in the 1700s it became quite an thing to drink mineral water, it seemed to be a health thing as it is I think disposable today a little bit, and of course they needed to be able to bottle them. Um, the problem with anything that's carbonated and when they started artificially carbonating things is one they explode, especially if you put ginger beer in, I'm sure all of you have had experience with that. I know in my family, we had a couple of years of beer exploding. But effectively, they created then these egg shaped bottoms, which were seen to be quite an enforced um, design. And of course, today, you know, champagne bottles go the other way. So they use the same principle uh, of the egg shape to be able to reinforce the base. And this is just with it on the outside. And of course, it was called. And the reason that they created them like this was that it forced people to lie on their side and that would then keep the port wet so that the bubbles wouldn't escape. So it was a means to be able to keep the combination within the bottle and know that the bottle wouldn't uh, come apart in itself. Over time they got the steel shaped one as well and we found both of these um, in the Rand Show grounds. Now, the final one for this, or the change from this, of course, was the card bottle. And the card bottle is quite an elaborate one. You can see this is clearly uh, blown in mold. It's a molded bottle. And what happens here is that your carbonated um, water, or whatever it is, pushes this marble up into the mouth and seals the bottle. Of course, when you want to drink it, you have a little aperture, it was, quite a, it was quite an elaborate thing, to push the marble down, and you push the marble into this little lip here, so that you can drink. And then you can knock it free if you want it to come up again. Now these bottles, of course, were used right up into the 1930s, but because of the trademarks, we can then tell more or less when they were in use. And both of these were used before, or around 1909. So we know they were part of that original uh, ground because Goldberg and Zephyr and Excelsior were effectively companies that opened up in Johannesburg at that particular time. Also, the bottles weren't necessarily made here at that time. One of them was, the other one wasn't. It was made in London. One was would be important and the water would be put in, in South Africa. Now, other things that came to light and of course allow us to date quite carefully is the Vaseline bottle. Um, Chisera had, of course, also in the 1850s or 60s, um, discovered that basically you could use uh, rod wax, so that greasy 
black steam matrix that you find on oil drill bits uh, and things like that. He found that people were putting it, was putting it on roots and it was helping to heal. So he, being a chemist, took this material, clarified it, and created Vaseline. And then, probably one of the very earliest um, forms of really touting your product, he started putting them in all sorts of containers and then traveling around and getting people to use it. I, I don't know if there's any truth to it, but they say that Cicero was so convinced that he had found sort of the elixir of life that he took a teaspoon of Vaseline a day. He did live well into his 90s, so <laughs> I'm not going to worry about that, but I'm not sure it's something that I'm seriously wanting to do. But what we see is that through the Vaseline bottle, they have start using uh, different or semi-automated machines to make it. And over time then, the Vaseline bottle changes quite uh, distinctively in a short period of time. And this particular one that we found has got a very distinctive step, two steps, coming down and then a V-shaped groove, which is typical of a battery model, um, at the bottom. And that particular machine operated between 1906 and 1909. Uh, so we know again that at least the bottle came from that earlier particular period. And then the other one that I just put in more for fun, because actually it was used quite late, is this particular bottle which contained Davis's vegetable painkiller. Davis, also in the mid-1800s, was very ill. He then, being a little bit of an entrepreneur, mixed a whole lot of opiates with alcohol and other vegetable products and created a medicine which miraculously cured him. He then started pasting this and putting it out. And of course, anything with an opiate base is going to be pretty problematic and alcohol. Uh, both are highly addictive. And of course, what happened then was that people started wanting this painkiller. It didn't really cure the ailment, <laughs> but it did kill the paper. And so people started using it quite extensively. And in fact, um, I think if I remember correctly, during the Civil War, Davis had already died. But that painkiller had become so crucial during the war that in fact, the Union Army took control of the factory to make sure that the product came <laughs> And it was sold until the 1940s. We have record of it being used here during that Second South African War, and also of being given to horses to keep them going. So anything with an opiate, of course, is going to be popular, and we see that it's still being sold at that early rancho in South Africa at that time. And then just some others that I, I quite fancy actually here's coconut oil or soot oily, uh, sweet oil bottle, and quite elaborate, quite beautiful, and of course, with what looks like either a sheer top or a burst top. Now, I'll show you another burst top in a minute, um, but obviously that, again, is a technique that was used in order to separate the bottle from the mold. And very often, they would then not um, polish it, can't remember who's polishing it. Yes, whereas, for example, you can see here the poison model, which were always in color and often had crosses and a warning with on them, has been nicely finished and polished. That ring has been added afterwards, but it has been polished. Um, some of the other models that would do that because it is said that it helped to hold the cork. And the one that was really popular at the time, which they did cork, quite a bit, is the little ink bottles. And this is a boat ink. The, um, the quill would be put across here. There was a way of storing it, and then you could dip it and use it. But you can see very clearly that this is what they call a burst top, where it's been in the mold, and then they blow apparently a bubble, a little bonus spread in the knee, into the, the joint where it goes into the mold, uh, thereby weakening and then just breaking. And um, again, they didn't bother to refine it because that first ragged edge held the cork a lot better than something that was polished and taken off, especially if you weren't going to wipe it. These are more boating, so are quite uh, something because they make them very quickly and they can hastily. We know that they were making them in Dundee and Natal at the time. It was a factory that was, in fact, um, making these little eggs. And so you often find that they stew 
they're often not quite balanced because they were just mass producing them at the time. So I hope that this thing gives you some idea of the kinds of ways in which we use glass uh, in sites, in the archaeological sites, in order to understand not only the networks that were in place, but also, of course, what people were using at the time and how they were using it. And it gives us an idea of where uh, these things were happening. And that's the beauty of using glass. The Red Show grounds show us then that this was probably the earliest part of the Red Show, that 1909-1915 probably period. Uh, at that time, we're seeing things coming in from France, we see Holland still, uh, France, Holland, and England, uh, and America. A lot of American projects, uh, products are coming around and into Southern Africa at that particular point in time. And that's where I'm going to leave my talk. Um, and say thank you very much. Um, so there's no way of chasing glass, can No. No. It's very difficult to get an actual date of it. Um, because you're dealing, I mean, I guess you, you're dealing with your silicates, but your silicates have been exposed to light. So we can only date a silicate if it's very for an extended period of time, and then we can date the period to which it was worked. But once you've worked it, it's been out and it's been trained around, it's, it's, it's not possible to get actual data for it. What they have tried to do, and I've seen now they're doing with some of the gold beads, is they're dating the leather pores that hold the beads together. So if they strung them on there, which they often did on some very fine sinews, uh, they can date the sinews. And that's how we um, With regards to beads that, that are falling apart, that, that are shattering my candy, as you just mentioned, yeah. would it be possible, I mean, as a theory, um, the other glass guys who have been correct that was that maybe they use different types of glass, that they actually used recycled the glass, and that these glasses were maybe incompatible, that is, they had different expansion coefficients. It's, it's just an idea. I'd love to know. I mean, it's, it was the first time, as I said, I've ever seen it, and it's quite possible. I mean, it might have just been, you know, look, we want cheap glass beads to go and trade to get us into whatever the case is, and therefore they would use it. <laughs> because I would, I would imagine that any any shard or broken or broken beads were kept and not discarded, and then, then collected and then probably remelted. Yeah, possibly remelted. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a really good question, and as I say, it's the only one. It's the only time I've ever seen it. Um, in regards to beads, where did the glass came from? So or how was it manufactured? So it's obviously it's manufactured in Asia um, at the time. And of course it's, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know, but going way, way back for five, six thousand, apparently they noticed uh, glass because a lightning had struck all silicon sands. And they realized then what would happen. And they were then starting to manufacture glass. We don't see a glass making tradition in Southern Africa at all. So we don't have any other evidence of them actually taking the silicon sands and turning it into glass and then manufacturing art from that. The only, as I say, one point in time we see is when those blue beads are coming down at K2 and they're remelting that glass, smelting it to in, in those little molds in order to make it. But we don't have a glass making tradition in Southern Africa. We only get the trading, which is actually useful because then it's, it's a nice way of establishing those networks. Is it the evidence of how that melts? We can't, you know, we, we're assuming it's mimicked on furnaces because they were obviously smelting metals at that particular time. They knew how to do that. And they're clearly pouring it into molds. So it might be along those ways. I mean, might we try to? To mimic that, <laughs> it wasn't easy. <laughs> but so they've obviously developed a, a mechanism to it. But as I said, what we can see is the failures, and you know the two different types of glass, as you say, possibly weakening, you know, coming together and it hasn't worked. And presumably the mild mold has been too wet, or you know whatever the case would be, and it's, it's just been a disaster. And then every now and again they produce some beautiful single bead. 
But yes, more than that, it's kind of we're not really sure how they can do it. Thank you very much. So, 
Um, you know, so this so, is so something that, that we, we put in the, in the foreground of, of, our, of our approach. What is also quite nice about Argo is that as a company, they are setting the, the, their leaders in the field of sustainability in Europe. We, as council, for sustainability was something that we were doing, but it does require quite significant investments in pockets. This is something we're actually quite excited about, that we're going to be able to have the support and dedicated resources to try and make the uh, sustainable possible. This means all kinds of things. It can be renewable energies, trying to ensure that your furnaces are using energy that is, that is uh, uh, carbon neutral, carbon free eventually, and basically just reducing your footprint from, from, from the energy point of view, and then also socially, expanding socially and trying to uh, support the communities and, and people in the areas that you are. Okay, so glass packaging, so in, in, in Africa now, so up until now, consoles primarily, or well not up until now, but consoles primary market has been South Africa. Okay, we have had four plants, but in the last seven, eight years, ten years in fact, we've, been, we've acquired facilities in Nigeria, Kenya, and Ethiopia. We've actually built new businesses in those countries. So now it's a total of seven plants in Africa, 15 furnaces, and 40 lines. To give you an indicator of that capacity, we melt on average a million tons of glass a year. Each one of our furnaces in South Africa is typically about 400 tons. That means we melt 400 tons a day per furnace. Um, some facilities have four furnaces, which are our biggest facilities. Other facilities have one furnace. Ethiopia, Nigeria, Kenya, while our weight facility and Nigel facility have two businesses. Okay, so that's an astonishing amount of glass. I suppose you guys know that the one ton furnace is big. So you can imagine how big a 400 ton furnace is. Um, and then also something I do too <laughs> have We are for decoration, and this is basically you get different types of decoration. I'm sure you've seen in the market, we'll touch on it when I show you the production. We are doing um, we do paint-based decoration, which is basically baked into the glass. We do sleeving, we do uh, etching. There's various types of paint. However, from our side, we just do paint-based baked uh, decoration. But there's other facilities that do the other types of decoration. All right, so so that's just an introduction for 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 Ida. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to show you. I'm trying to keep this thing relatively high level, and then you guys can ask questions. So the video that I'm going to show you, I think really gives you an idea of how we go about making glass. There's a lot of detail in every step, but um, I'm not going to pause the video, I'm just going to play the video through, and then you guys can ask questions, etc. So just before I play the video, um, glass making at an industrial level probably really started in the early 1900s, and that was with the invention of the IS machine. Right. This is called the independent section machine, and it was created by a gentleman called Michael Owens. I mentioned the company Owens Illinois. Started in America, in Pittsburgh, or somewhere near there. And that's where they basically created a machine which would have a semi automated mold which would open and close, and they would basically revolutionize the making of glass bottles. It standardized the mass and did all kinds of Obviously, allowed you to start outputting more and more and more, and that went from a semi automatic machine now to an automatic machine um, to the machines that today, which basically can make some machines can make uh, 800 bottles a minute. So, compared to plastic, that's not such a big number, but when it comes to glass, you can imagine how heavy that glass is and just how amazing that whole process is. You're talking about a material that when it gets put into the mold, it's 1,200 degrees, and that whole thing has to get control. The machine must burn down. It's, yeah. Okay, so yeah, so let's do that. I'm going to just reduce the lights and then start playing the video. Since the beginning, when the Earth itself was formed in the fiery forge of cosmic activity, nature has given us a substance that today forms an integral part of our lives. 
glass. When humans first discovered glass, it would have been naturally occurring. Perhaps it was volcanic obsidian or the result of lightning striking sand. We were immediately captivated by it. But the relationship had just begun. Today, glass touches our lives in so many ways and is recognized as a trusted, versatile and 100% recyclable packaging choice. Join us as we explain the glass making process, a magical, specialized journey to produce nature's packaging. Glass starts its life as raw materials combined in a specific ratio. The recipe calls for sand, soda ash and limestone. Elements are added to color the glass. Iron results in a green glass, for example. Copper in blue. Glass is infinitely recyclable. And we incorporate a large amount of recovered glass, known as colored, to reduce the amount of raw material that is used. Colored also melts at a lower temperature, enabling us to reduce emissions and save energy. Raw materials are stored in large silos and delivered to mixers according to strict recipes. Arda Glass Packaging uses leading-edge technology to ensure that the mixed material, or batches, delivered to our furnaces meet our stringent quality standards. It takes around 24 hours for a batch of raw materials to be converted into molten glass. Batches are continuously fed into the furnace, which is the beginning of what is known in the glass industry as the hot end, for good reason. The temperature of a furnace is approximately 1,500 degrees Celsius or 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. From the furnace, the molten glass makes its way to the refiner area, where it is cooled to approximately 1,200 degrees Celsius or 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit. Maintaining the correct temperature is extremely important, not just to sustain the flow of the molten glass, but to ensure the highest quality of the end product. From the refiner, the four hearts deliver glass to the individual bottle-making machines. Streams of glass are cut into gobs of a predetermined weight, exactly as much as is needed to make a single bottle. These gobs are guided into the individual molds of the bottle-making equipment as part of a process known as forming. Bottles are formed in two molding stages. In the first stage, the gob of glass falls into a blank mold and the opening of the bottle is formed. The final glass container is formed using one of three methods. The first, known as the blow-blow method, is used for larger containers. In this process, compressed air is blown into the molten gob to create a cavity, resulting in a hollow and partly formed container. This is then transferred to the second molding stage, where compressed air is used again to form the final shape. The second method, known as the press-blow method, is used for jars and food containers with larger finishes. Here, a metal plunger instead of air is used to press a cavity into the gob in the blank mold before compressed air is used to form the final container. The third method, known as narrow neck press and blow, is used for narrowed neck containers, which require significantly less glass. Here, a metal plunger instead of air is used to press a cavity into the gob similar to the press blow method. The newly formed bottle is removed from the mold and transferred by conveyor to the annealing oven or layer, where it is coated with tin oxide to strengthen it. Cooled from 600 degrees Celsius or 1100 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit in a controlled manner and then sprayed with polyethylene wax to protect the surface of the glass. All glass containers manufactured by Arda undergo multiple tests and inspections to ensure that they comply with strict international safety, health and environmental standards. The bottles undergo further visual inspection by sophisticated, high-resolution camera equipment as well as trained specialists. Once approved, our containers are enhanced to our client specifications and to support their brand building and operational requirements. This could involve further coloring, embossing, debossing, coating, sleeving, decorating and labeling. With the manufacturing process completed, the bottles are individually coated with production date and time, packed on pallets and covered with protective shrink wrap before being dispatched to our customers. 
Arda is a proud global supplier of sustainable, infinitely recyclable glass packaging for brand owners around the world. The consistent pursuit of market-leading innovation, quality and customer service, backed by investment in our people and processes, underpins everything we do. Thousands of years after it was first discovered, glass remains an integral part of our lives. The beauty, versatility and endless sustainability of glass inspires us to create innovative modern glass containers with a functional elegance and timeless quality. So yeah, so that's how we, we, we basically do it. And that's what they will then be 
system to collect the glass from our customer time. ABM, Distel, Tiger, all of them we collect glass from them. Do you want your system free So you have to have a combination. So we used to be almost exclusively <coughs> uh, electric furnaces. Electric furnaces are more efficient. The problem with them though is they require electricity. There's not a lot of that going around. So from roughly 2010, we have actively converted to, well, not actively, since before that, but basically we made big decisions yeah, in roughly 2010 to, to move away from electric furnaces and now we use natural gas furnaces. Um, you can't get away from electricity though, so natural gas is used as your primary melting material uh, fuel. But in order to circulate your glass, so you get an even composition, you use electrodes uh, which put huge currents into the glass and cause circular currents. It's kind of like a mixer, and it mixes the glass, so you can never get away from that. But it's roughly about 30% of the energy, I'm about 70 years. It's gas. We would like to move back to electric. So they are more efficient, um, cheaper to build, easier to build, and maintain. But they typically have a short lifespan, but overall they are more efficient and sustainable. So yeah, so hopefully we can go back to that. The amount of energy that you require is so massive that renewables at this stage have not gotten to that level of, of supply. So but we, are, we are working on that, um, and we also have a, we have a significant amount of photovoltaic cells which we're using for, for um, daytime capacity. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, we'll look we'll to get there. There's other materials which we look at burning. Um, however, natural gas is probably the best from a point of energy or bigger tools. Um, hydrogen, which we're also looking at. Each one of them has benefits. Hydrogen is probably the one that's clean to burn. Carbon it is extremely difficult to store. So you've got to compress it. And then that's where the problem comes in, but they'll get there. And uh, yeah, that's that's the last question. So how are you managing the load shedding so how are you keeping those numbers today? So that's the other thing that's very significant about glass. You can never stop birds. So it's not like you can just stop and go. That furnace has to stay hot. I'm sure you guys know the sort of condition of the furnace and collecting the light. You've got to keep it warm. So um, we've got agreements with with council <coughs> and that they can't just load share us as one of the primary users of glass of, of, of energy. However, it does happen. And um, it's something that when it does happen, we basically keep the furnaces warm but not operational. And we keep it warm. Uh, not actually with, with, with uh, natural gas, at that point you actually have uh, actually glass wine, but then you have to use heavy fuel oils to maintain the temperature. Um, so that would be things like clear soaps and, and, and shipping oil, and, and that's what we use as backup systems. The backup system for, for our conditioning is LPG. Um, yeah, why do I Yeah, it's a huge, huge problem. Um, and it's quite scary because you're in a glass plant and you don't know how for a long time. Uh, you can develop glass leaks, and once that happens, then it's. Yeah, it's dead. So. <laughs> Just for comparison, I mean, uh, what is your tonnage? If you have any production numbers? I, don't know, I might have missed that a little bit earlier on, but um, just, just to get an idea. In comparison with the furnace that, that we have here at the TNT studio? So, each one of our furnaces, or let's say our furnaces are optimal, optimally sized furnaces, the most recent furnaces, they are 400 tons a day. So, we melt 400 tons in a 24 hour cycle. That's basically what the mass is. <laughs> so, it's a lot of bottles. I think we make roughly 4 billion bottles a year. In regarding to the sand, do you collect it or purchase the sand? Different types of yes, sand. Yeah. So the sand has to be extremely pure, and yes, it's actually very specific to our industry. Um, so we actually own our own deposits. We 
do purchase a certain amount of it. So we've got silica mines. Um, some of them are alluvial, and some of them actually require blasting and drilling and mining. So the biggest issue though is ensuring that you have deposits that have extremely low um, impurities. So iron is the biggest uh, issue when it comes to, to, to discolor, discolor glass. Discolors glass very easily. So yeah, so so we basically um, we've got facilities in the Cape, and then we've got also in the North, and that's actually one of the biggest concerns is trying to ensure that you can maintain the glass. The other thing about glass is because of soda ash. Soda ash is used in many things around the world, and at the moment there's a shortage, and it's extremely extremely expensive. And um, what is it? It's a, it's a very commercial setup in some country. But um, are they interested in doing some, some sort of creative, like a uh, religion or, you know, because for us, obviously, we are just artists and we, we like this very small compared to like. But in the same thing, you know, we always think there could be links in some way. Obviously, it could be a nice beautiful commercial stuff, but you know, if somebody from me used to be able to work with that thing with glass, and this would be different locations, but it's sort of still the same. Um, are they interested in doing sort of like, I don't know how, but sort of like that? I don't know if you're thinking of doing some more high end product or, or not so really at all. At, for the last few years, things have been, resources have been limited. Yeah. So I think the benefit now of being quite a hard is they yeah. definitely have, they've got what they call innovation centers. Yeah. Uh, they've got, uh, significant investment in, in education and in developing people to move into glass for a commercial level. But um, so to answer your question I don't know. But I would say that there's a higher chance at this stage that that would be something yeah, no, yeah. considered so, that you know, Yeah. So I know that uh, so I made Chaz through an initiative to try and customize a big industrial machine to, to make it into a small operation. We weren't successful only because the problem was that we don't own that technology. And this is where the project kind of got a bit kind of done because if you don't own it, you can't take responsibility for it. And then there's things like safety and all these things that, that come into play. Now that's not going to affect maybe on the creative side, but definitely a micro manufacturing yeah. side to make very customers or very uh, bespoke bottles, for example gins and whiskies and all kinds of interesting uh, craft products. So consoles actually had quite an evolution in that regard. It, was, it started just like one size fits all. You had to buy a whole truck or else we wouldn't kind of deliver to you. It's evolved to a point now where we've got single pallets uh, delivery and we've got retail shops uh, to, to sell them. So I think we're going and um, yeah, maybe we can sell them. Question. I mean, a while back, in my lifetime, um, bottles to be reused. Why don't we? Why don't we consume that? So, eighty percent of of beer drunk in South Africa is from internal or reusable bottles. Um, the problem with returnable glasses requires a logistics footprint to go and get those bottles back and to and to keep them in their original integrity, no chips and cracks and all those things. So um, it is quite niche. Only big players can do that because they have significant distribution networks and good control of the of the product. So yeah, no, no, that's definitely something um, something that's recently been adopted by the by government is the EPR, which is I always forget the acronym, but it's it's basically the Producer's responsibility to ensure that a certain amount of packaging is returned for reuse and for um, recycling. So that is actually being pushed through to try and encourage that. The concern that we have is we can't just tell someone to do something and go to more. So the biggest issue with reuse being getting that bottle back. How do you encourage and incentivize people to, to get your bottle to? There's definitely lots of opportunities there. I think someone's going to find something that will be 
Is there a possibility to have um, that one can visit the, the plant and actually so do, do, does Water offer a tour for educational purposes? So not so we used to. And this is before I even started I didn't do it. So um, it's a pity that they don't do it anymore, but I think uh, small groups can be arranged. But yeah, it's something that we would rather like to, to try and get going again because it's quite a Fascinating to go to a dance plant. Um, it's incredible. Like that video doesn't show you the heat. The it's just quite. I'm sure you guys are working on the premises with it. <laughs> but yes, it's quite intense. It's quite amazing. It's true. The backing machinery that's required. Uh, yeah, it's it be something I'd like to, to try. Because uh, the, I mean, the factory never stops ever. Yep. It runs 24/7, 365. And production lines just keeps going. keeps going at the same pace. It's insane, yeah. So it's not okay for maintenance, but it would be for a line here for burners. And the burners will generally stop for maintenance in about after six years. And then it's what we call a partial maintenance just to make sure it's safe, make sure it's okay. And we want to get another six years. So typically you get 12 years after the furnace. And we just keeps running for 12 years. And then it's completely We could tour for the students here. Yeah. 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 We used to go. We, we went to yeah. the, used to be the small Edison street. Uh, yeah. Right hand tour. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, Sandra was just telling me earlier that they just rebuilt the furnace in way of that. And they took the entire team into the furnace. So yeah, just fun. tell them a little bit about that. Um, what it looks like. It's right. really, yeah, it looks like it looks like a room bath inside. Because it's got <laughs> it's like several <laughs> like, well, not really good. Uh, so you go inside and basically it's got several arches and um, it's the, the roof is suspended. It's basically made of a crown. Free bricks, there's no cement, all sits on its own, uh, keystone from the yep. center, just like a, a, a room architecture. But the scary thing about that is that it heats up, right, and really has to expand. And so you've got these, these, these compression, compression joints, and as it starts to heat, those joints uh, get, get released and it kind of just moves with it and it closes. And, yeah, it's quite an interesting process. And we've got another rebuild. What's more, but that's nowadays. It's only first, but um, next year we've got a big one on W3, so maybe it's something to go towards to see if we can organize that. Yeah. Put our names on the list. Give me, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so normally, the tough 
I think about going into a furnace is it's not like, oh, we just finished the furnace, we can go inside. It's like if everything is on top of each other, people are working on each other, which is the last day. And then you've got what you call your dog house. The dog house is where you, because it looks like a pen, it's where you feed in your batch. And that's kind of the last point that they put up. And then you can come out. So just being that that's always been the limitation. It's not, there isn't an elegant transition between building it and starting it. It's just right. like, it's chaos. So, um, and how do we do that? We've got 
approach shading devices that we calculate in the way that we fit in the summer, but that allows the sun to come in the winter. And we've got horizontal and vertical and also hybrid um, solutions for that to protect. So, being architects, we love to use challenges and to turn that into opportunities. So, in the African context, we see this as opportunities for artistic expression of the art and form giving of the words. So the toolkit that we're talking about here is shading and footwear. So how do we shade? We shade our glass by using deep setbacks. We've got wall punches, so for instance, if you've got something facing the uh, wall facing to the west, you use small punches in that wall to limit the Western sun, because the Western sun is quite hot and it's quite low. Uh, we've got sharp shadows, the beautiful thing about the African sun. It's got a certain quality, it gives us really sharp shadows, and architects love using that as part of their composition of the inside. And also deep frames. If you frame the, the, the window with a very deep, deep frame, the sun is not reached. Filtering as well, we use screens that then manipulates the quality of your light that comes through the glass. Recent is also, if it's a French word, for, for allowing the sun in, but also the breeze, and then also the manipulation of light, how you use the light that comes through the glass for the quality of light on the inside. So it's that play between temperature. Nature, glass, and atmosphere that you want to create. So these are the countries that I visited Algeria, Morocco, Mali, Nigeria, Mozambique, and South Africa. It's just a land range of um, exciting projects that I personally like and don't like, but that demonstrate certain um, reactions to the limitations that. When we work with the class. And then also show you one or two examples when all the rules work. Right. <laughs> um, so, Algeria, that is the, uh, the zone uh, right to the north, the climatic conditions there in Algeria, it's arid, a semi arid desert. The sky is without clouds for the greater part of the year, but thus haze and storms are frequent occurring mainly in the afternoon. So direct solar radiation is intense and is augmented by radiation reflected from the barren light colored plane. So the recommendations there would be windows and ventilation relatively small, particularly, particularly on the outside walls, and must be shielded from direct radiation and glare. And then also for walls that also play a part here is the simplest solution is to follow tradition and use thick walls. So this is an example in Algeria in Sidi Bel Abed, in the 1950s, it's a market. And if you look at the toolkit that he applied here, deep setbacks, then he made use of the, sh uh, the sharp shadows and the manipulation of light. If you look at that dome over there, those little holes in the dome, that is actually I'll show you just another few factors of that. Here again, just another part of the facade, you can see the beautiful shadows because of the deep setbacks, and we use that as an architectural feature. And this is what the market looks like on the inside. Those little holes with glass in gives you almost a spiritual space um, that can be used. Then I moved to Morocco. The climatic conditions there are similar to um, where we've been just now. Um, in Morocco, I have a look at Agadir, the Bajan Franchois, the Zabarco. Um, the quite sustained school in 1961. You can just see that beautiful facade. He used a deep set back and really banked from the African sun and the shadows and the contrasts that it gives you. And in terms of design, that is just Part of that same um, uh, school, you can see there on the um, right left hand side 
small small branches because of uh, protecting from uh, the sun, sharp shadows, uh, deep set tracks, and then the use of a screen. But we use that as an architectural element to decorate the nice building. Then we move to a bit more of a contemporary example, also in Morocco, in Matum. In 2014, this was designed by a collaboration of architects. Al Kabash, Ketani's and Tiana architect, this is group for technology, where they actually built uh, an additional facade, so almost a passage between your external wall and, and uh, the elements banking again or making um, use of the deep shadows, sharp shadows, and and I find that extremely dramatic, but also quite um, relevant and, and how you should design an area like that. Um, you will also see the deep setbacks and the sharp shadows that we can make it has on the architecture. And then the glass gets to also be displayed and, and used, especially if you want to start using larger elements, larger pieces of glass. Really um, I moved to Nigeria. The climatic conditions there are slightly different. It's warm, but it's wet. So it's fairly cloudy and hazy throughout the year. The skies are bright if um, the cloud cover is limited and the sun is not hidden. So the radiation is diffused and reflected and scattered by the clouds or the high vapor content of okay. air, um, but uh, it's strong in the sky. Um, then with the recommendations there on windows and ventilation openings should be large with thin beds or similar, uh, similar size with my spread of air is needed so it's not cross ventilation. Screens, lattices, walls are useful to admit air flow and provide protection against air. So openings must be protected from radiation glare and driving rain and noise. An example here from the 1960s in by John Rodman and Jillian Hockwood. It's a private residence. Here you can see deep setbacks. We survey those screens and, and they can actually move. Um, the screens bear the back and sharp shadows. So they are getting that use once again back in some as a structural element. Uh, just another facade on that side of the residence. You can barely see. Very well um, then a, a, a bit later on in Nigeria and Ibadan, uh, by the Master Moku, he's actually an artist, a sculptor as well, but he also uh, played a lot of architecture a bit, and his focus was to incorporate a lot of materials as well and local traditions. So this is a chapel for the Dominican Institute that he designed. Um, and here we once again have deep setbacks. The screen is actually quite a sculptural and uh, decorative element, and the manipulation of the light, obviously, you can just imagine the light shining through and the impact it has, and the effect it has on the inside. What he also did is um, he applied a bit of stained glass, um, a few exercises there, um, and that relates to a project. It's um, uh, where you pass the glass in concrete and actually use that as a wall. Um, I'll show you another example just now. But a beautiful chapel, beautiful, beautifully uh, grounded in the local traditions. Um, another facade, uh, those crosses, deep setbacks are protected from the sun, but obviously you can just imagine. Moving to Mali, because I thought you want to show a project by Francis Kere. Um, you won the Pritzker Prize for Architecture, I think it was last year. Um, arid and semi arid desert. Uh, we've spoken about um, those climatic conditions. And um, what he did here is large overhangs using roofs as glass for large overhangs to protect the glass from direct sun. Not always that. Successful, but shaping and, and framing the 
collapses. Large uh, glass facades, but you can see these uh, brick ribs on the sides. It's actually to uh, calculate it. Put the angle of the sun to try and protect the brick glass facade. But that makes the architecture the main of the spot for the architecture here. Then also, if you look at the inside, the light and the light quality for the um, exhibition spaces inside there are the spaces. Then we move to Mozambique. Uh, Mozambique is also warm and wet. Um, we all know that the conditions there. Uh, very hot um, and the humidity is actually quite high. And we're looking at the work here of Pancho Pidesh. Pancho Pidesh um, in the 1950s, um, he was uh, amazing, he was an amazing artist in the way he sculpted buildings. Over uh, here in the Santos Eroca building in Maputo, he used filtering of light. We you limit the size of, of the light that actually comes through the openings, screens, and then on the inside, I manipulate the light quality. If you look at the, if you look at the screens um, in, in the buildings in the terminals, we also have a big impact on uh, the lights and buildings in the computer. And then here, yeah, the recent day um, elements that it used as a sculpture. And then his famous smiling lion building, it's still standing today, uh, 1958. You can see the setbacks there on the western side, the, the western facing facades, the small facades, small bunches, deep setbacks, but extremely sculptural. And this drawing here just uh, explains how he played with those facades and trying to figure out how best he would want to solve it. Problem there with, with light openings and um, making it very sculpture. Then we move to South Africa. Right, so our cloud climate is a bit different. It's wet and dry, it's a composite climate. Uh, it varies with the seasons, as we know. Clear blue skies, the sharp shortly, especially after the rainy season, but as does the content of the air increases, so does the light. Radiation, direct diffused and from the ground, moderate to high. So the recommendations there. Windows must be protected from radiation and clear, both from the sky and the ground. But shading is undesirable in winter. Obviously, we want our sun to come in the winter as much as possible. Windows, um, adequate shading for windows and external activities in summer. Is So the first example here is in Pretoria. This is a house designed by Peter Bad in 1964 for himself and his family. And what they did here is you can see that uh, mushroom shaped column. The whole roof is supported by six, I think it's about six of these mushroom shaped concrete columns. And what it does is it allows the facades to hang from. So, and it frees the facade from any um, purpose or, or function to support it. So, he's got glass facades, double story glass facades that hangs from these roof structures. So, the glass can be completely open. You can get the feeling that you're in, in, in the space surrounded by glass. But then you have to screen the glass. Obviously, it's because of the thing against the sun. But then we translated that into a very effective um, with these very super screen blocks. And you can see how that actually complements uh, the design of the house. Um, the next one is a quite a, a recent project that was done by my young colleagues and heritage consultants here in, in Pretoria. It's Merton Keep. Merton Keep is where the French embassy housed at the moment and they did recommendations on the whole project. But this tower here, uh, you can see it's got a glass roof and 
And you can just imagine the amount of heat that get, uh, gets in there and how do you predict that. Now, um, Gutten Kip was originally a uh, person who started um, the Ruebos tea industry in South Africa, doing this kind of They That's not a Ruebos tea, it was dead roses or something like that. Okay? Um, and this is their solution. Uh, it's a screen that they designed with the light in front of the roads that lights, uh, that allows enough light through but filters the light and then creates this beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, uh, I just think that one of them is a quite sophisticated solution. Um, and this, this is a estimation project. Um, I think that's quite then we moved to Johannesburg, uh, Steve Young Mass completed the Johannesburg Council Chambers in 2016. That's quite a dramatic building. Um, not a lot of screening here. The glass was um, it's curved glass. You know, it's curved glass elements and uh, uh, manipulated to uh, prevent the sun from, from coming in too much. Uh, but also what they used to do with the inside, they would use the screen walls as well um, to assist the screen the light. And this whole chamber was designed on, on the base of the Kotla. We actually gathered together and make decisions together. Quite a dramatic uh, solution. You can see those fins as well, being used as a picture. This project here uh, by us, Thomas and Clark Architects, we call it the Last Glass House. It's in Johannesburg um, because we ignored all the rules. We broke all the rules, um, there's no protection, it's just a celebration of glass. Um, Large uh, glass facade that was designed for an artist, uh, we were play. And um, this was the last time that the project could be done before the legislation changed. So, legislation became energy calculations, energy um, saving devices became quite an important uh, passive uh, aspect that we had to start introducing. But So you can see the very, very big facades all covered with glass. And uh, what we did here, we were, it's quite interesting. This whole building was built, it took two years to build, but to put the structure up, it took a week. It was pre manufactured, the whole galvanized structure, prefabricated, and uh, installed in a week. And then we started installing the glass. The glass took about a year to install, or actually the frames. The glass didn't take that long, but we actually uh, stuck the glass in the other side of that. So this whole building is built with glass that stuck together with the other side of that. And this was done in 2015. I visited it uh, a week ago, it's the same. <laughs> that was why they had this holding on. <laughs> but the celebration of um, over here, the last person I'm going to look at is Liv Thorn. He was an artist in the 60s in South Africa, and he specialized in uh, this uh, way. He went to study in, in uh, France as well, where um, they built glass facades with its combination of concrete and glass. Um, there's a word for that. Um, I'll, I'll get it just now. So they, they he actually lays out the glass on scale one to one, he draws it out, and then they um, make he makes the elements that will then really pass the concrete in with um, the uh, rebar and everything for support, and they put the 
was in the middle. Because the concrete impels and it dries and it uh, cures and then eventually that concrete is panels. Uh, it's quite thick. You can see the, the concrete limbs are actually quite thick. And this specific uh, example here, Christ the King Catholic Church in Queensbury here, it's 120 square meters across the one we saw. It's massive, but absolutely beautiful. So solid pieces of glass are made in the concrete. Um, there's another colored one. But this is not really encouraging about the fact that this is this, mm -hmm. this facility. Um, and the other one is in the center of town, is where there's a block that you can church. We also use the same method. Um, it's glass. Fixed in uh, big force concrete. Um, and that's also still standing in Pretoria up to today. Um, and Newton did more than 120 glass panels in, in South Africa in 120 churches. And so one extensive amount of work that he's done and absolutely astounding. So I want to end on this note with a celebration of. He also wrote all the rules, no uh, protection over the past, but obviously we need all the way to celebrate the use of the past. Okay, thank you so much for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Is there anyone doing work like that? Yeah, it's here. Yeah. Deal from, at the moment, no. I know the guys in Kenya do work like that. No, 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 no. Uh, no. Uh, yeah. There's a uh, front of no. he, he does similar work with Muslim Peace. Uh, I think the, 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 the technique is called Delta Bear. Yes, um, yes that's yeah. Yeah, it's, it's using Delta the, Bear. It's thick costs, yeah. glass blocks that then, then get encased in, in, in the concrete and the, in the rebar. Um, mm. And it's insanely heavy, it's, it's sturdy, and it just, I think it's the last millennium. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I, I was just wondering how they transported without the writing those those channels, but in mass, you know, there's within sections of the show. And then section, yeah, and then on sites together, yeah. yeah. Is he still alive? I don't know. It's quite nice to have him to do a talk on the numbers. Um if I'm not mistaken, I stand in a correction here, but I think Paul is also learned that name. Were you guys inspired or was it still that part where you just playing around? Because I see that the colors like it scattered different areas, so it's actually interesting. So I yeah, so I think that was more like a graphic exercise, you know. But the the, the, the cheating of the thing, the whole building is clear glass, and the colors on there is not glass. It's it's stickers that we we actually put on the glass. 
Now the building was sold recently, and the new owners is a fashion um, house, the Beer Studio, that was um, funky. They, they, you should actually go and have a look on, on Instagram. And they just put the stickers on and put their own colors on. So the building has changed the look and feel now to fit their um, brand. Um, and they went it, it with the company's own one. So the colors are more gentle, it's more pastel, pastel, pastel colors. And uh, that building actually offers the opportunity for change as well. They occupy the building as well. It's 150, 100 meters long, sorry. It's about 50 meters long and half meters wide. So it's quite a one massive larger space. And then they populate it in the way they want to make it. So what is that um, the Instagram name of the town? So the fashion the house. house. Yes. It's Vivier Studio. V I V I V R S. So uh, it's on Vivier. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, and they're really, really mm -hmm. um, yes. uh, it's a young company, about three years old, which is definitely going for us. If I look at all these gloss facades, per se. I think they can be canvases. I mean, whether one uses vinyl or attaches other glass elements or um, light elements, because the main function of the glass is to bring light into the interior. Um, and, and, it's, and it's just that uh, I, I, I was really mesmerized with the, with the marketplace. Um, it is that it's, uh, it's just a complete insane effect by just punching holes into the, into the roof and, and, and playing with light. But I think. Is there many ways that, that one can explore so it? So many possibilities here. Yeah. And one thing that people always forget is that you can actually write on the glass. I just love writing on the glass. Hmm. Uh, you know, to, to use the windows in, in a, a facility where you've got large windows, use a cookie, just wash it off, but in such a nice uh, effect it actually has. It, that, that reminds me of the, the, the shadows of the roses. That, that, yes. I mean, using the, the writing or text or graphic elements yes. as a type of shadow play as well. So you're blocking. You and can, ever change. Yeah. yeah. You can change it every week. Yeah. 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 Giving me ideas. It's also yes. not the shadow that's created, yeah, it's just the art of it. And it's actual, sometimes the way it changes, the shadow becomes the art of the wall, the way it comes down. So, yeah. It's also something yeah. else. Thank you very much. Why not you? I So I was asked to talk about the glass production as part of a circular economy. And uh, when Lotto first asked me to talk on the subject, it was obvious that I would talk about it very much because that's how we run our business. But before we get there, I thought I would do a little bit of research into the origins of wording and who coined and when the, coined, the phrase was coined in the circular economy. So, search on Wikipedia tells me that the first idea of the circular flow of materials and energy appeared as early as 1966 in a book by Kenneth Balding. And he talked about cyclical or cyclical system of production. The term circular economy, however, appeared for the first time in 1988, and it's been expanded on since then. In the early 2000s, China integrated the notion into their industrial and environmental policies, funny enough. In 2005, Ellen MacArthur, who's an accomplished yachtswoman, broke the record for the fastest solo circumnavigation of the, of the world. It took her just over 71 days. And during this time, obviously, she crossed all the oceans of the world. She noticed how much rubbish was floating in all our seas. And so she decided to do something about it. And she thought she created and started the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And she's been instrumental in getting businesses to more circular, particularly 
in Europe and the Americas and has dedicated her life to being an ambassador for a more sustainable world. So the Ellen MacArthur Foundation defines the circular economy as a system solution framework that tackles global challenges like climate change, biodiversity, loss, and waste pollution. <clears throat> In our current economy, we take materials from the, from the earth, make products from them, and then throw them away as waste. So it's a very linear movement. The circular economy, by contrast, stops the waste from right at the beginning. So a circular economy is based on three different principles. And they're all driven by design. To eliminate waste and pollution, to circulate products and materials at their highest value, and to regenerate nature. It is underpinned by a transition to renewable energy and materials. A circular economy decouples economic activity from the concept of consumption finite resources. Uh, we all know that our resources are finite, and even the other side of the says it has these mines, mining and sadness, so, but you know, one day that's going to run out. So do we have a solution for that? And it is a resilient system that is good for business, people, and the environment. The circular economy is about creating business with embedded environmental impact. Let me say that again. The circular economy is all about creating business with embedded environmental impact. I grew up on a farm, and as you know, most farmers are really good at looking after the environment because if they don't, they're not going to have a very good business. So, this was ingrained in me from birth. My parents and I bought a wedding glass of liquidation in 1987, and my parents, being farmers, were very practical, and I studied as a marine engineer. So, again, I'm a pretty practical person. None of us had any idea about glass other than having the odd beverage. Who's supposed to laugh? <laughs> <laughs> and many people told us we were absolutely mad. With the knowledge of glass that I have today, I can wholeheartedly agree with it. Would I go back 35 years with the knowledge that I have of glass now and open a defunct glass factory in a small kingdom of Eswatini with no customers? Mm, probably not. But being a newbie in the glass world in 1987 had a massive advantage for me. I didn't need to unlearn things that were done in the past or how it was supposed to be done. So when it came to using processes that are better for the environment, there were no pitfalls for me. Yes, I was experimenting with new concepts, but I didn't really have the old tried and tested rules to fall, to fall into. So we just forged ahead. Some of them didn't work, but most of them did. Being young and enthusiastic, the glass boundaries, there were no glass boundaries for me. It is transparent after all. It's supposed to not. <laughs> On many occasions, I would go to the team with an idea. The standard response was, nah, can't be done. I was not very good at taking that as an answer for a good idea that, well, something that I thought was a good idea. So I got under the team's skin a lot in the early days. The case in point is a wine glass that I drew, I was doodling on my, my desk pad, talking on the phone, and I drew a wine glass with a stem on the side rather than the traditional one in the center. I took it to the team and they thought I'd gone mad. <laughs> After much nagging, we eventually got, managed to make it, and today it is our best selling work. Ideas were not all about product design, but 
but also about improving our manufacturing process and the relationships we have with our staff, our community, and of course our relationship with the environment. Before we knew it, we were a circular company, long before we'd even heard the phrase circular economy. We have coined a phrase, carbon handprint. All of you, I'm sure, have heard about carbon footprint, which are the practices that are bad for the environment. Carbon handprint, on the other hand, are those practices to mitigate the bad ones. We all know how much energy it takes to melt, or make, and anneal glass. So we glass makers have a massive carbon footprint. But we've never dealt, dealt with this. Because without it, we wouldn't have a glass business. It's just the nature of the beast that is glass. However, we've rather concentrated on and spent a lot of time and energy on our carbon handprint. Funny enough, I recently read an article written by a guy called Jasper Steenhauser, who's an advocate for the circular economy. I think he lives in Copenhagen. And I quote, and I'm sorry if this differs slightly from what you said earlier. I quote, we are so used to hearing about sustainability in terms of minimizing. Often the ultimate goal is zero. Zero waste, zero carbon emissions, zero pollution, zero whatever. As a business person, we get up in the morning to make more. More turnover, more profit, more products, more growth, more jobs. So it's no wonder that most business leaders over the years have concluded that business and sustainability don't go hand in hand. Energy comes from creating something. And there's no energy in zero. It's in our nature to create and grow and expand. This is how we have evolved as a species. A good circular business solution is that one creates a positive impact. Not just being less bad, but really having a positive impact. Unquote. So this goes back to our carbon handprint idea. So coincidentally, it seems we've been doing this from the beginning and implementing some of the thinking over the last 35 years. And we are forever looking at ways to improve our energy production and consumption. We've always recycled bottles as our raw material. And these are collected by organized groups, schools, individuals, all over the kingdom of Switzerland, or Eswatini as we are now. But we've only ever used the clear flint bottles. We naturally realized that there was a use or a need for a solution for the colored bottles that we had no use for, other than sending them back to console from miles away. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> We built crushing machines that turned the bottles back to a sack, which is obviously the main ingredient as you saw from the earlier presentation. And we used the sand to make building blocks, mixed together with concrete, obviously, um, and reducing the amount of sand that we would usually have dug out of the rivers, also creating an environmental problem. And we've used these building blocks in projects to, as we've expanded our business to help our staff build houses. And it works really, really well. We initially used diesel in our, to fuel our furnace. However, with the ever increasing fuel costs, we found that we could run just as efficiently if we changed the paraffin, which was quite a bit cheaper in those days. But as you know, fuel prices have been rising steadily over the last 35 years, forcing us to increase the price of our products. Ever mindful of the possibility of pushbacks from our clients, we needed to find a solution for these rising prices. 
During a conversation with a friend who owns a motor dealership, he was explaining that they were having a major problem getting rid of their used motorbike. And on further research, I found all the dealers, as well as all the backstreet mechanics, were having the same issue. In the words of Winston Churchill, who said, never waste a good crisis, we decided to try and see whether we could collect this oil and use it to burn in our furnaces. We soon realized that the oil came from many impurities. Obviously it had bits of metal from the engine and quite a bit of water. So we invested in a small centrifugal separator and built a purifying plant to solve these issues. We did find, though, that the calorie value of the oil was not high enough to get the temperature we needed in the furnace, so we created a 50-50 mix of paraffin, and it worked really, really well. Although we were solving one environmental issue by stopping the old engine oil ending up in our water courses, we were ever mindful that we were creating emissions that were harmful to the environment. We then identified that fast food items also had all the oil that they needed to get rid of. And this being a vegetable oil, the emissions are 100% better than the old engine oil. And although more expensive for us to buy, we did make the move. <coughs> we now collect all the KFC, Spur, Nando's, Pick and Pay, Steers, old oil across his team. And of course, this oil comes with its own issues, like little bits of chicken and flour, <laughs> and potato, gunk, and gunk. Yeah. And this, of course, blocks up our pipes and our burners, especially during winter. However, it works really, really well, and we've managed to push the mix from a, to a 65% cooking oil, 35% paraffin. At the moment, I'm looking at rather converting this oil into biodiesel using ethanol, but I'm not quite there yet, so watch this space. If I can do that, I'm hoping we can get rid of the paraffin with the oil. As a matter of interest, we burn around 120,000 litres of old oil every year to melt the 100 tonnes or so glass that we turn from broken bottles into beautiful, useful products. Not quite as much as well. <laughs> so one has to wonder where the oil would end up if we didn't collect it. As we know, glass is fragile. I love the sound of breaking glass, but only after my customers pay them. <laughs> and so it needs to be packaged really, really well. We learned very early on that when packaging glass safely, it should not be able to move in its outer part or whatever it is being packed in. If it can move, the likelihood of it uh, getting broken in transport is extremely high. So initially, we used sawdust that we collected from an old, like, from a, a furniture manufacturing plant. And although our customers were happy to receive their products in one piece, which they battled with with our predecessors, cleaning up the sawdust in the likes of the Santa City didn't go down so well. So we listened to our customers and we changed to old newspaper. Bubble wrap is generally the go to packaging for fragile products around the world. But we are very anti plastic, and although we do need to use a little bit of overlap every now and again for our really big products, we keep it to an absolute minimum. And we use around 20 tons of old newspapers every year in our factory. The factory roof fitting in Gwenya Glass is quite substantial. So we installed 5,000 litre tanks on all our, not all of them, but most of our downpipes. And we have capacity to store 60,000 litres of rainwater. This water is used in our grinding department, which is also then recycled back to the machines, as well as our toilets. We have over 50 staff, and we get around 5,000 tourists 
a monkey coming through our door, so you can imagine we use a lot of water in our toilets. And in the rainy season, we manage to run entirely on that. We don't have to buy any water. With the ever-rising costs of electricity and the doom and gloom of load shedding in the, in the future and right now for you guys, we don't get it in this particular moment. Um, we installed 550 solar panels on our roof, which on a good day gives us 92 kilowatts or around 110 megawatt hours per year, which is around 40% of our total electricity. Needs. And then as we started to come out of COVID, we invested in another 182 panels. So now, on a good day, we have free electricity all through the day, enough to run our entire factory. And obviously it has reduced our electricity bill uh, substantially. Unfortunately, we still need electricity at night for our ovens and they can be done. On Black Friday in 2018, we decided that we were not going to join the rest of the retail world and offer ridiculous prices or discounts on our product. We decided rather we were going to do something for the environment. And we invited volunteers to join us to do a cleanup campaign in our region. And we called this Black Bag Friday. We didn't get many volunteers to help, but so the management and the staff of the factory spent about two hours or hours in our area picking up rubbish from the rivers and along our roadsides. We didn't realize the extent of the problem until after many hours and two bucky loads of, of rubbish it looked like we had made no dent whatsoever. So the decision was made that Black Bag Friday would be a weekly event. And we now do it every week and have collected tons and tons and tons of discarded trash over the years. I'm tired of living in a rubbish dump, and I'm sure you guys are the same. And so we're doing something about it, especially in this routine. We have a plan to change the attitude of total disregard for the environment and our beautiful kingdom, and it involves children rather than adults, in the hope that the children will take the practice home and teach their, their parents as well as continue throughout their lives as ambassadors for the only planet we have to live on. Until Elon works out how he can all survive on Mars. I recently had a meeting with the community services manager of one of the of schools in Eswatini. And the idea is that we're going to get their children to create a 10 minute video on the consequences of littering. And this we will then distribute to all the schools in Eswatini through a network that I have managed to get my hands on. We feel that children teaching children will have a much greater impact than adults doing the job. And then we'll have an annual competition for the most clean school, the most amount of litter collected, or we're not too sure the logistics of this, we're still working out. But we believe the rubbish ball is starting to roll and will grow as a momentum growth. So the Sisu, who you, most of you have met, often relates a very funny story an experience he had with my father many years ago. Mkulu, as my father was called by the staff, was driving Sivasisu somewhere, I'm not sure where. And Sivasisu finished the cool drink, opened the window, and chucked the can out. Mkulu slowly slowed down the car, pulled over to the side of the road, eventually stopping some distance from where the can had been discarded, and turned to Sivasisu and suggested goes and fetches that cat. Embarrassed, Sibisi ran, ran back down the road, picked up the can and ran back. He has never lived it again since. And that was about 34 years ago. So, we can teach the people. Over the past 10 years or so, we've been fair trade accredited. 
received an A minus in the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's Circulitics Measurement Tool, received B Corp approval, We've been voted the best tourist attraction in Eswatini and received a number of local and international awards. And we achieved all of this without being forced to change any of our processes or systems. We've managed to achieve this because we take our carbon handprint extremely, extremely seriously. Our impact in our community and the environment as people and as a company is always first, first and foremost on our minds. In 2015, <coughs> the United Nations adopted 17 Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs they call it, which is a shared blueprint for peace and prosperity for people at the planet now and into the future. It is an urgent call to action to the entire population of this planet. And once again, without having to change anything, when your glass ticks all 17 years. We're very proud of this, and thanks for the applause, <coughs> but we're not done yet. <coughs> We will not sit back and polish any badges. We are always looking for better ways to run our business with the community and environment in front of mind. Coming to circular economy from a business point of view and creating value from solving a problem is essential. These are some of the typical results that we have experienced by becoming a circular company. Cost reduction, increased sales, Innovation, access to new markets, product development, competitive advantage, being ahead of the upcoming regulations, investor relations, employee satisfaction, increase in productivity, attracting valuable partnerships, attracting and maintaining talent. And in Granny Glass, our mission statement, and it's been like this for a while, is to produce the best quality handmade recycled glassware in a viable, sustainable, circular economy in an environmentally sensitive manner, implementing solutions to protect our community, wildlife, and planet. We are living proof that working in a circular economy can be a profitable and sustainable and has enabled us to survive the most the worst pandemic in recent history. I strongly believe that no matter the size of the glass business, whether it's a small studio will melting 30 kgs of glass or a massive massive bottle bottle massive bottle manufacturer melting what I had here was a hundred times. 400 tons of glass per day. It is 100% possible to operate profitably within a circular economy. As mentioned earlier, it is not the carbon footprint that we need to concentrate on, but rather our carbon handprint. If we can change the mindset of all businesses, I know we can go a long way to solving a lot of world's problems. Thank you. Short video if you want to watch a little bit about what we do and how we do it. Um, let me play that and then I'll answer any questions you might I'm sure by now we don't have to tell you that here at Inguinia Glass, all our products are completely hand blown from 100% recycled glass. We have a mini solar farm on our roofs and we use old cooking oil to fire our furnace. In our production, we use old newspaper and grey water collected off our roofs in order to manufacture our products. Each product goes through a minimum of 13 loving hands before it leaves our doors. We donate a percentage of our worldwide sales to the Elephant and Rhino Fund here in Eswatini. The environment, our staff and community around us are extremely important to us. 
We are a green, fair trade and circular economy company. Without our customers and supporters, we could not help improve our communities by helping to pay orphan school fees, build ablution blocks at local clinics, and help our staff look after their families and to prosper in their lives. At Nguyenia Glass, we are more than just glass. Any questions? When are you going to make colored glass? <laughs> Coming. <laughs> so yeah, we were just to answer that question. We're working on a project right now with, um, with the ITC, International Trade Center, who's supporting us to find a way that we can create colored glass with our um, recycled bottle glass. Um, there aren't any manufacturers in the world making colors for our glass, so my initial concept was we were going to make our own glass with the colors as our base. But there are some colors out there which are very, very difficult to make. I mean, blue is an easy, green is an easy, but when it gets to yellows and reds and that, and those are important colors in our color that we're going to do nice um, artwork. So we found a professional through Lotta, thank you very much for that, a guy called Peter Pachinka who works in Sweden, and I met with him last week. Um, and he's rather going to tell us, his, his idea is rather to change, we're going to add maybe some soda ash and something else to our glass. It's not going to be 100% recycled anymore, but we're hoping it won't be, uh, we should be around 90%. Right? So we're going to manipulate the glass to increase its coefficient of expansion. And he was hoping to take us up to, and at the moment it's 81, 82, our COE, and he was hoping to take us up to 96 which is a big jump. Um, so we can use Kugler and uh, Reichenbach colors. But actually in our discussions last week, I would recommend that maybe we should rather head towards 90, which is bullseye, and we could use bullseye colors. Nobody's done this before anywhere in the world, so if we can get it right, um, artists around the world could really go this way. Instead of paying what you're paying, 70 rand a kilo for your crystallic Actually, Peter, by the way, was a guy who developed this um, Then, I mean, it's a lot cheaper to use recycled bottles and put a little bit of fluxes and, and, and soda ashes into it or something, and still be able to make beautiful bottles. So, yeah, it's a project we're working on. We're hoping Peter will be with us December or January. Um, it's quite a, it's, it's going to be a, it's, it's not a quick fix, but hopefully by the middle of next year. And we'll be happy to share the rest with you. Anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be Any more questions? Are we all saturated? Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. We we're going to continue with. It. We'll have that discussion, but we have run out of time. So it's one o'clock, it's lunch, I'm sure everybody's hungry. And um, I'm going to leave you with this question to ponder and maybe for a future discussion is where do you see glass in Africa? How are we going to get there? It's a question that I think is important that belongs to the new generation, the next generation, that belongs to the existing artists um, and makers. How are we going to develop in a sustainable way right? from Chad's point of view as well from industry where we go? So I'm going to leave you with that question. Thank you very much. Enjoy. We're going to have some lunch and watch some love.